the Skinwalker. A little background first. I was serving a 15 year sentence in a penitentiary in southern Arizona. What I was in there for isn't important. During my stay there, there were countless things that happened that no one could explain, and even more that no one wanted to know more about. It all started with a prison legend. Supposedly, years ago, something awful and unexplainable happened in the prison. Every morning, we'd be woken up and expected to stand near the front of our cells while guards visually confirmed we were present and accounted for. Apparently, about a year before I got sent there, the most brutal and unexplainable thing happened during one of these routines. A man who had his cell to himself looked very off during this check. When a guard pulled over another guard to help him check it out, they found it wasn't actually the prisoner they were expecting at all. It was a totally different man. This man was wearing the skin of the other man over him. Loosely fitting, draped over him, apparently looked like a real monster. The scariest things were though, was the guy wearing the skin was not an inmate. They had no idea how he even got into prison, let alone a cell. What's worse is that they couldn't even figure out who the hell he was. He wasn't documented anywhere. And what's worse than that, they never even found the body of the man of the skin he was wearing. Pretty grisly stuff, I know. And I realise that's not the go-to definition of a skinwalker. But that's what the prison called him. The skinwalker. Didn't help that the guy never talked apparently. Anyway, that's what started the whole skinwalker superstition around the yard. Apparently, the guy got shipped off to a different spot about a month after it happened. And just about everyone felt all the better for it. I heard about the story on the second day of my stay. Hell of a story to hear about your home for the foreseeable future. Now, onto the real stuff though. Sure, that guy was the skinwalker, but all he did in the long run was get an old lifer inmate to tell everyone about actual skinwalkers. It seemed like a lot of the prison culture actually revolved around them. Now, apparently, Skinwalkers are tricky to point out on the spot, but if you manage to survive around one for more than a minute or two, almost everyone can tell the mannerisms are all off. They can mimic human speech, but not replicate it. They twitch maniacally. They have an unnatural gait while walking, but apparently they got better with experience. The old guy, his name was Carl, said that he was sure there was an actual one among the prisoners, slowly picking us off over the years. He called it the Grand Master Skinwalker at some point. Apparently, he thought it had human mannerisms down so well, you might not even be able to tell if it was your cellmate for a day or two. It had to be good, he posited one night. He would expect a skinwalker to jump at any opportunity for a kill. But this one realised it had a revolving door of people to kill coming to it, and masterfully bided its time, as Carl thought, for years. A lot of guys found humour in it, a lot more were really on edge about it. Every once in a while, in prison, people snap. Sometimes you'll find your cellmate swinging in front of your bunk, strung up around the neck by his pant leg. Sometimes you just can't take it anymore. But in our yard, people tended to snap in a very special way. It wouldn't be an outburst at dinner. Guys would just stop talking, hunch over and shuffle around. Any friendships they had would be mostly out of the window. They'd turn into a loner during rec time. They would let their hair hang in front of their face. No one likes to talk about it. Like if they did, it would happen to them next. I felt the same way. I didn't know if it was a skinwalker or people just going crazy, but I didn't want to find out. It wasn't clockwork or anything, but every time someone snapped in this way, 
it wasn't more than a couple of weeks before they were shipped off or transferred to God knows where without anyone else knowing beforehand. Then there were the nighttime occurrences. Short, loud bursts of sound echoed through my cell block during all hours of the night on a regular basis. It sounded like a mix between a pig's dying squeals and nails on a chalkboard. Just another thing no one likes to talk about. Even scarier were the shadows and footsteps. The block was dimly illuminated in the night by a few lights hanging from the ceiling outside the cells. I myself saw shadows flit across my walls on a regular occasion when there were definitely no guards near my cell. One time, near the end of my sentence, I woke up, looked at my back wall and found a perfect silhouette of a person standing there. But when I looked, my bunkmate was asleep and no one was outside of my cell. And the footsteps. Everyone hated the footsteps. They were the scariest part. In the night, sometimes, more rarely than the shadows, you would hear ungodly fast footsteps. They sounded like wet feet slapping on tile floor. Whatever caused them would fly from one end of the block to the other in a dead sprint. Whatever it was, it was inhumanely fast. If you happened to be awake before it started, by the time you heard the footsteps on one side of your cell and whipped your head around to see the thing run by, it sounded like it was three cells past you. Everyone hated the footsteps. I agreed. I thought they were the worst. I was released from that place about a month ago. I have more stories than I can count. I swear it was nearly my turn. About a week before I was discharged, my cellmate and a good friend of mine snapped. I didn't sleep for an entire week. Well, I did sleep of course, but never for more than a few minutes at a time. Never turned my back on the guy. The scariest thing? I woke up one night to him somehow snaking his body through the bars of our cell. For reference, I couldn't get anything past my shoulder through them. The worst part though, he was coming back into our cell. On the day of my release, I didn't say a word to him. I just left. He seemed fine with it, and so was I. I'd made it through 15 years of prison fights, gang disputes, and for all I know, skinwalker abductions. I left through the front gates, a free man. As I walked along the fence for the wreck yard, I spotted my cellmate, standing off on his own, like he had for the last week or so. I shook my head, not even really sure if it was him anymore. I took one last look over the yard, this time from the other side of the fence. I wish I hadn't. There, standing off on his own, on the other side of the yard, was Carl, slouched over, eyeing the other inmates and twitching maniacally. Imposter Syndrome My wife, a spoiled only child to wealthy parents, grew up in rural New York. We'd been married for eight months at the time, and things could not have been going better. We had a house, great careers, and a couple of cars to really sew in the American dream. We'd been planning on getting a dog, with thoughts of children not too distant either, though things wouldn't go as planned. One morning, my wife got a call from the police, informing her that both of her parents had died in a car crash. I'd never seen her so distraught my entire life. After the wake and the funerals came the nitty gritty legal stuff no one ever wants to talk about after a death. When we went over the will, we found that her parents had left her their estate. A 200 acre plot of land with a million dollar home on the lake. We were shocked, to say the least. We began moving in as soon as possible. We sold our old house and cars and graciously accepted all of the belongings her parents wished us to have. There was one problem though. The house just felt dead. It was so large, yet somehow cramped. All the walls seemed tighter than they should have. 
and you could scream from one end of the house and not hear it at the other. It took some getting used to, but the old behemoth finally grew on us. At least, that's what I told my wife. When I was home alone, there was just something disconcerting about the place. A creak in the floor and rustling on the windows. The chill on my neck when I walked past a reflective window, feeling as if I was being watched. I truly hated it. My wife worked late every weeknight. She took care of people in a home for the elderly and her shifts ran from four to midnight. I usually enjoyed that brief alone time. I would often write or read or sometimes really get into a movie and this was one of those nights. I settled in for the night. I grabbed a few drinks, wrapped myself in a blanket and started my movie. It was a Friday and only eight o'clock so I figured a few beers wouldn't hurt. I had four and a half hours until my wife got back. I cracked a few and made it about halfway through my movie before I heard something downstairs. I swear I thought it was the house playing tricks on me like it's done many times in the past. I tried to ignore it, but then I heard something slam. I quickly got up and went downstairs. My heart froze when I could see the glow of the kitchen light that I know I had turned off. I quietly inched my way to the large doorway that entered into the kitchen. I could hear movement. An overwhelming sense of dread seeped over my body as I finally peeked around the wall. It was my wife. Jesus Christ woman, I half jokingly shouted out to her. She jumped, startled of my presence. Oh God, don't scare me like that, she said. Don't scare you, I just thought I was about to die. And you don't think you could have called out to say hello or something? And why are you home so early anyway? Is Julie alright with that? Yeah, she's fine. I told her I wasn't feeling well. And? Are you feeling well? I asked, seeing that she seemed perfectly fine. She had a guilty look. I'm totally fine. I just didn't feel like being there, she said with a half giggle. I found it surprising. She never comes home early, and she didn't seem to make a big deal out of it. I quickly changed my focus when I noticed she had a few bags of groceries. I asked her what she was making, to which she excitedly responded, Chicken Alfredo. Oh damn, can't wait. Need help? I asked. She turned around with a knife in her hand as she laid out the chicken. She smiled and said no. She slowly pointed the knife towards my face with lusty eyes. Tonight is about you, she said, getting the knife closer to my face. I'm going to make you this dinner, and maybe later you can help me with a few other things. She smiled again deviously. I bit my lip and watched her continue to prepare the meal. I told her I was going to watch the rest of my movie. I went upstairs and sat down ready for the show. About 30 minutes later, my wife walked into the room the knife still in her hand. Dinner's ready, is all she said as she slowly left the room. I went down minutes later to find the dinner all nicely set up and ready to eat. The table looked amazing, too amazing. Oh my god, you outdid yourself. I've got to get a picture of this. I shuffled through my pockets and noticed I'd left my phone upstairs. I quickly went up and couldn't seem to find it anywhere. I'm sure it was just lost in the blankets. I went to the top of the steps and shouted down, Can you call my phone? She laughed. No, you've got to work for this picture. Come on, I said. My food's getting cold. There was no response. I continued looking around for about three minutes until I finally heard it vibrating. I found it on the ground underneath one of my shirts. It was my wife finally calling me. Finally, I said, and hung up the phone as I stood up to go downstairs. The phone rang again. My wife, again. I answered the phone. What do you want? Excuse me? And what was that finally for? And why are you being so rude? She said. You wouldn't call my phone. Sorry I can't call you whenever you think about it. I'm at work. I've got stuff to do, 
she said, sending a cold spike through my core. What did you just say? I asked. I said I'm busy. I've got another hour of work and I was just calling to tell you I miss you. But you got to answer the phone like an idiot, she said. So you're saying you're not home in the kitchen, I said, my voice now quiet and shaky. Oh, ha, ha, I'm not in the kitchen, good one, she laughed. No, no, I mean there is someone here that looks exactly like you downstairs. I thought you came home early. I gulped as my realisations paralysed my body. You need to lock the bedroom door right now and find whatever weapon you can. I'm calling the police, she said frantically. Babe, what the hell's going on? Who's that? I asked, fear flaking from my voice. It's my sister. I stayed in the room until the police arrived. Turns out she had gotten skittish and left far before the cops got there. They found arsenic in the food, the knife stuck in the table, and a note with four words. The house is mine. My wife never told me about her twin sister. Apparently she'd been in and out of prison and psych wards her whole life. She'd been disowned by the family and was as good as dead. That is, until she heard about the accident. Now, all those strange feelings I was getting feel a lot more valid. And those feelings haven't stopped to this day. The Night Bus For context, I'm a middle-aged man who lives on the outskirts of Parbold, a small English village. My house is the only one on a long winding country road, but it does have a bus stop. From my bedroom window, I can see it on the other side of the road. It's quite handy, really. I never miss the morning bus to work, and I know the schedule off by heart. That's why I was bewildered when I first noticed the 3.17am bus on Saturday the 14th of October. It woke me up, actually. I'm a light sleeper. I sat upright in my bed, twisted my body around, propped myself up on my knees, and gingerly inched the curtains open. The old lamppost on my road illuminated an ominous, fully grey, non-branded, single-decker bus. There was no interior lighting, and I couldn't see a driver or any passengers. Now, this was obviously bizarre. Buses don't show up at that time in the morning. Not in this country. Not in any town or city I know anyway. Still, I assumed, as any person would, that times were changing. It seemed like a good idea. A bus for those who've missed the last train home after a night out, perhaps. That still didn't entirely make sense because very few people use my bus stop. It's a 10 minute walk from here to anywhere. I checked the schedule. Nothing. There was a bus at 11.07pm on Friday evening, and there shouldn't have been another one until 6.05am on Saturday morning. I watched a vehicle pull away and considered, perhaps, that it wasn't a public bus. Maybe it was a hired coach. That seemed like a reasonable explanation. I put it out of my mind and went back to sleep. However, it returned the next morning, and it continued to do so for weeks. Again, I checked the schedule. Still no mention of a 3.17am bus. I called the council, and they assured me that it wasn't a public bus. They said that I could contact the local authorities to report any suspicious activity. So, I rang the police. They didn't care. They passed me over to some civil department with a forgettable name, and that department just passed me over to another department. Nobody was concerned. It became clear that each person I contacted just wanted me to tire of the whole thing and stop bothering them. I gave up on seeking help, but I didn't give up on my quest for an answer. I started making notes. The bus always arrived at exactly 3.17am. It would linger for approximately 30 seconds. No one ever boarded or departed the vehicle. I took a picture of it and posted it on various forums. No one could identify the origin of the faceless grey bus, but one comment did stand out. I remember a user 
telling me that I should sell my house and move. They said that the bus was there for me. Most importantly, they said that I shouldn't, under any circumstances, board it. That seemed like a rather obvious piece of advice. I wasn't planning on boarding a sketchy, unlisted bus in the pitch black hours of the morning. But everything changed on November 20th. The bus arrived on time, 3.17am. I knelt on my bed and peeked at it through the curtain as it rounded the corner. Something was different. I couldn't quite put my finger on it. Once the vehicle had rolled to a complete stop, I heard it. Somebody on the bus was screaming. I froze. I didn't know what to do. Silence followed, but I knew I hadn't imagined it. I knew I'd heard that scream. I watched the bus and waited. Thirty seconds passed. A lot of time passed. When I finally peeled my eyes from the road to check my phone, it was 3.29am. The bus hadn't moved. The world outside was still eerily quiet. I reattached myself to reality and started dialing for the police. The call kept failing and then I saw that I had no signal. None. I usually had signal at the house. I was freaking out, so I got up to turn on my bedroom light. Nothing. I flicked the switch back and forth. No power. The story was the same throughout the house. I was about to head to the fuse box, but I looked out of my living room window to see a blackened world. The lamppost was dead. It had to be a power cut. That was when I finally understood for the first time in my ten years of solitary living that I was truly isolated. I had no neighbours, no friends, no family. I was all alone. The gravity of the situation dawned on me. I would have to leave the house. My self-preservation instinct was to stay indoors, but I couldn't ignore the disembodied scream that had echoed throughout the night. I knew it had come from the bus. I also knew I couldn't live with myself if I was to dismiss it. Armed with a winter coat and a wind-up torch, I bravely ventured into the night, locking my door behind me. I tentatively strolled down my front path, stopping at the gate to cast the torchlight onto the other side of the road. It revealed the grey, stationary, seemingly abandoned bus. There were no signs of life, everything was so quiet. I swore to myself that I could hear my heartbeat in my eardrums. I swung the creaky gate open and began to cross the road, futilely attempting to steady my quaking knees. My torch wobbled in my shaky left hand, so I clasped my wrist with my right hand. I shone the light into the windows of the parked vehicle. There was definitely no driver, but it was an elevated coach, so I couldn't see whether there were any passengers. I walked around to the front of the vehicle, summoning the courage to enter it. When I reached the other side of the bus, I stood still. I tried to control my breathing. I eyed the doors for what seemed like an eternity, and then I felt my entire body clench. The doors opened. My torchlight still wasn't revealing a driver. I couldn't see or hear anyone. I thought, for a brief moment, of that internet stranger who told me not to board the bus. But I couldn't get the scream out of my head. My gut told me that somebody was in danger. I stepped onto the bus and I started to climb the stairs. The doors closed. I held the torch before me as if it was a weapon and I gradually climbed the next set of stairs to the elevated passenger platform. I spent several seconds on each step savouring what I felt could be my final moments on earth. Then, I illuminated the passenger area before me. I half expected to see nothing. No, there was somebody on the bus. The young girl was sitting on the middle seat of the back row. Her head was in her palms. She was crying. I couldn't see her face. Are you okay? I asked timidly. No answer. So, I started to walk forwards. I didn't know whether there was anyone else on board, but I couldn't leave her. 
once I was standing only a few yards in front of her. I knelt down in the aisle. Are you okay? I asked the second time. The girl's crying abruptly ceased, but she didn't lift her head from her hands. You shouldn't have boarded the bus, she replied. My torch died. I furiously wound the lever at the side, but it didn't spring back to life. The girl and I had been plunged into darkness. Then I heard the bus doors open. I slowly turned my head to face the front of the bus. I could hear the sound of low, guttural breathing. It was followed by clunking footsteps. Dim moonlight shone through the front window, but it was sufficient to display a hulking figure at the other end of the aisle. A black spectre with gangly limbs was moving towards us. He was hunched forwards and his elongated arms dragged along the tops of the seats. He was too tall and too wide to fit in the aisle. I turned to face the girl. She had lifted her head from her hands. I could barely see her. I could barely hear her. This is the last stop, she whispered. I was really hoping you wouldn't board. I wanted more time. Before I could even comprehend what was happening, I felt an icy limb coil itself around my ankle. It yanked and I fell. My nose connected with the floor of the aisle and I heard something crack. I thought that was it. I thought that was the end. But I looked up to see the demonic creature coil its other limb around the girl's neck. It hoisted her from her seat. She screamed as she was lifted towards the indistinguishable figure in the aisle. I couldn't really see what happened in the darkness, but I'll never forget the sound her body made when it was consumed by the black entity. It sounded like leaves crunching beneath walking boots. I had almost entirely lost my sense of reality at this point, but some vestige of survival instinct persisted in my fractured mind. I twisted onto my back and looked down at my ankle. I couldn't really see what I was doing in the dark. I just knew I had to act. So, with my free foot, I stamped on the creature's limb. I stamped as hard as humanly possible. The demon, which had been devouring the poor girl, unleashed an inhuman wail. It pierced my eardrums and shattered every window on the bus. The limb retracted from my ankle and returned to the shadowy being. I seized my opportunity. Catapulting to my feet, I spun around and lunged for the now glassless back window of the bus. Clinging to the frame of the window for dear life, I took one last look at the dark entity that was hurtling towards me. Then I dropped to my feet on the road. I sprinted away from the bus. Adrenaline fueled me onwards. I didn't look back. I just kept running. At the speed I travelled, I think it only took me a few minutes to reach the warm and welcoming lights of civilization. I looked at my phone and cried when I saw that I had service. I booked a taxi. I wanted the farthest possible destination. I chose Manchester. Then I took the first train to London. For the past couple of weeks, I've been living in a hotel. I know I was a little late, but I finally took the advice of that online stranger. I moved away. I moved far away. I don't go out at night. And I definitely don't look out the window after 3am. The Visitor What a pleasant way to begin my 3am shift at Mercy Hospital. The first thing I did as I sat down was cut my finger. It was a paper cut. And despite working at one of the largest hospitals in the state, I couldn't find a single band-aid laying around. I sucked on my index finger like a vampire while I scrambled my desk for that band-aid. I found one, purple. I'm a hospital receptionist, and all that means is I greet visitors, make appointments and look nice. Well, as nice as a 30-year-old man who hasn't slept in hours can look. That night, as we call it, it was just me and a few nurses on the floor. Other than that, it was ghost quiet. 
except for the heavy, thundering rain. I sat back on the cheap recliner chair all receptionists get the honour of using. While adjusting my band-aid, I listened to the television mounted on the corner of the wall as it broadcasted a seemingly important message. Authorities say the woman was last seen on Cedar Avenue. I looked up to see if the television was showing any images of this strange woman. None. It was yet another crazy person with no name and no face who we were supposed to look out for. Not creepy at all. Authorities say the woman was reportedly walking around and asking people very, very bizarre questions. I focused back on my desk and continued working, but still listened as the news anchor went on and on. She continued. The following statement was issued by an unidentified government official. Listen carefully, folks. Whatever she asks you, answer no. Do not, under any circumstances, answer yes. Officials won't comment further as to why, citing security clearance. Police are asking that you immediately call 911 if you deem anyone suspicious. I thought that part of the coverage was quite odd, but I wasn't sure anything could scare me anymore. Working here at the hospital, I thought I'd seen it all. At the flash of the ruby red ambulance lights, I've seen people come in with severed arms, legs, fingers people who somehow manage to scoop out their eyes, and much, much more. You get used to it. My head was practically sunk into my desk as I filled out paperwork. That's when I heard something very subtle, initially. I heard it coming from the front doors, the entrance. The automatic doors opened and closed, opened and closed, slamming against each other and sounding a pronounced loud thud each time. The very dim lighting I had surrounding my desk flickered incessantly. Hello, I called out, seated behind the safety of my desk. Only the whistling wind responded. Hello, I called out again. I felt obligated to check if someone was there, especially since it might have been someone who was injured and needed our attention. I reluctantly picked myself up from my chair and walked over to inspect. I nearly slipped and cracked my head open as the entrance floor was almost flooded from the rain. I noticed footsteps, wet shoe marks that seemed to come inside the hospital and then back out. I stood near the doors, poking my head outside and looked. All I heard were the distant sounds of sirens and honking cars. The rain poured harder. The peace and quiet was disturbed within moments of me sitting back down. The automatic doors started again, opening and closing, slamming shut and letting in more rain as they did. But this time, I heard gentle footsteps make their way towards me, tapping closer and closer. Someone slowly emerged from the darkness between the entrance and the front desk. A woman with drenched black hair approached, wearing a dark brown raincoat and a pair of boots that were too large for her toothpick legs. Her face was inundated with wrinkles and wet makeup, her black eyeshadow smudged. Despite the heavy rain outside, she didn't seem to have bothered wearing a hoodie. Hello, how can I help you, ma'am? She didn't respond. She looked around, scanning and observing an unimpressive hospital. Is there something I can help you with? Still nothing. We engaged in a brief stare down, which she won. I looked down and pretended to gather important paperwork. Are you here to visit someone? Then finally she responded, without talking. She simply nodded and then took a few steps forward, her hands hanging down her side. Her posture was unnatural, almost uncomfortable. Okay, for now I need you to sign here. Then. You'll have to wait a few hours for visiting time to begin, I said, pushing forward a sheet of paper and pen. She raised her arm to sign, and then abruptly stopped. She seemed startled by something on the desk. She looked at me, tilted her head, and, with a smile wide as her eyes, said, Would you please move that for me? I was confused at first. 
but then she pointed at it with her index finger, as drops of rainwater tapped against my desk while her arm hovered over it. I took the little crucifix we had on the front desk and put it in a drawer. The woman proceeded as if she was going to finally sign the paper, and then stopped before writing anything. She dropped the pen on the ground and stood there again, staring at me. She asked me a question. Do you reject the Trinity? I'm sorry, I replied. For a few more uncomfortable moments, the woman stood there like an ancient statue. I had no idea what she meant by the question. Ma'am, who exactly are you here to see? Family? Friend? What's your relationship with the patient? Before I could finish talking, midway through my question, the woman turned around and walked out the door, still smiling, and her eyes as wide as I'd ever seen on a person. I went back to work and tried to move on, but her creepy mannerisms were trapped in my mind throughout the night. At around 4am, I spotted one of the children in a hospital walking down the hallway. Nina, is that you? I called out. All the kids in the hospital knew me. I was proudly considered one of the cooler employees. I let them break the rules. I brought them snacks upstairs. I even told them scary stories, despite their predictable regret later on. The nurses would get angry at me every time I held one of my scary story nights. They always had a bunch of bed sheets to change the next morning. I only did these things for the kids when I wasn't busy, when it was a quiet night. And this was one of those uneventful nights, which of course was a good thing. Anyway, it was very odd to see Nina awake at that time, walking down those shadowy halls. She was absolutely terrified of the dark, and yet there she was. Nina, is that you? I squinted my eyes as I walked towards her. Sorry, Matt, she began. I don't want to be there anymore. She had dragged her blue blanket along with her, which was a way of gesturing to the staff that she wanted to move to another room. The other kids bothering you again, I asked. I took hold of her hand and began walking her back to the elevator. Please don't make me go back up there. I don't like the new nurse. I stopped walking. What? I said, kneeling to Nina's level. She keeps asking us the same question over and over. I said no so many times. I kept telling her no. But everyone else kept laughing with her and saying yes to her. Please, I don't want to go back up there. Nina's words immediately played flashbacks inside my tired, overworked mind. Something about a strange woman going around and asking even stranger questions. I didn't pay enough attention to the broadcast to notice the woman. But even if I had, I thought she had left the hospital. I ditched the elevator and ran up a flight of daunting stairs, stomping against each step with all the force I could muster. I probably woke up all those sleeping employees I was so loud. I opened the door to the children's room and I couldn't believe my eyes. I checked each room, each one on each floor. I woke up my co-worker and asked about the children. She couldn't find them either. We looked everywhere and put the hospital on lockdown. We set off all possible alarms and emergency procedures. We didn't find them. They just disappeared. <laughs>